Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. On the show tonight, hate crimes against black Chicagoans are up 50% so far this year. We talk about hate crime reporting and how the city can improve in supporting victims. The right to vote, even with a criminal record. In a follow-up to our permanent punishment series, efforts to make sure people impacted by the criminal legal system know what rights they still have. The Supreme Court takes up two cases on affirmative action in college admissions. We break down the arguments. They feel like their creativity, their passion, their desires are just as important as anybody else's. And an organization on the South Side is using art therapy to encourage youth in the juvenile justice system. All that coming up. But our first story tonight, Chicago's rise in hate crimes. That's right after this. Chicago Tonight, Black Voices is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Hate crimes against black Chicagoans are up 50% so far this year. Chicago Human Relations Commissioner Nancy Andrade says that black people are one of the most frequently targeted groups of hate crimes. The agency says it's received reports of 16 hate crimes against black Chicagoans as of last month, while the Chicago Police Department has received 27 anti-black hate crimes, hate crime reports this year alone. Joining us now are Janine Bell, professor of law and social justice at Loyola University Chicago School of Law, and Karen Freeman Wilson, president and CEO of the Chicago Urban League. Thanks to you both for joining us. Janine Bell, let's start with you, please. Remind us first, what constitutes a hate crime and who makes that determination? All right, a hate crime is a crime motivated by bias on the basis of race, religion, sexual or orientation, it depends on the, the, um, the specific law contains the category. And again, these are categories, they aren't um, individuals. Um, so a hate crime is a crime motivated by bias on the basis of this particular category. And the individuals that determine whether something is a hate crime are prosecutors that prosecute hate crimes. And as we said, the city's Commission on Human Relations received 16 reports of hate crimes against black people this year, CPD receiving 27 reports, uh, and both of them are saying that's an increase over previous years. Janine, what is your reaction to those numbers? I think those numbers are really, really low. In a city the size of Chicago, you should have many more, one would expect many more reports of hate crimes. So I think that there are hate crimes that are being not reported. Karen Freeman Wilson, I see you nodding your head. Uh, what is your reaction to those numbers? I certainly agree with uh, the professor. I think that that is low reporting. I believe that people may not be as aware of the Human Relations Commission as one might think, and that they just have not bothered to report hate crimes. And of course, uh, the commission reports that, uh, that blacks are one of the most frequently targeted groups. Uh, Karen Freeman Wilson, back to you. Your concerns about why that is in a city like Chicago? I think that um, you see that incidents of hate crimes among black people or against black people because there is a general um, atmosphere of not uh, of bias against different people, in this instance, black people. But um, there is an atmosphere where people feel that they can say whatever to whomever and that they can, in fact, uh, express hateful opinions and that they can do it out loud. Janine Bell, why do hate crimes go unreported or underreported? Individuals may fear the police. They mis may mistrust the um, police. 
if the police are not showing themselves as open to the investigation of hate crimes and catching perpetrators, if in other contexts, law enforcement does not show that they are willing to help victims, individuals who are targeted by hate crime, then there's little impetus to report. And, and Karen, of course, you know, the police mistrust factor, Janine just brought that up. People may not feel comfortable going to the police. What should the city be doing to better support black Chicagoans who are victims uh, and survivors of hate crimes? You know, police community trust is certainly an issue. And I think to get uh, people to feel more comfortable, you really need to let them know, one, what a hate crime is, two, where they can go, and to publicize it highly uh, in places like churches and other places, places of worship, like community-based organizations, like the Chicago Urban League, so that people understand that they have a recourse. And I think that's the most important aspect of this. You don't just have to allow people to say anything to you and to uh, use hate speech and not report it. Janine Bell, what would it look like for the police to have a better uh, hate crime reporting system in place? In every district, in every police department, there would be an individual officer who is responsible for the investigation of hate crime. Um, there would be outreach to different victims advocacy groups that um, knew that um, you contact this particular police department, um, the police departments, you contact the bias unit in the police overall. Those are some of the things that would make it um, better for individuals who are targeted by hate violence. And, and to that point, how could community organizations better support the reporting of hate crimes? Um, they could uh, make sure they have a good relationship uh, with the police department. Open lines of communication with the police department uh, would be a first step. Karen, what do you think are the consequences of hate crimes going unreported? I think the consequences of unreported hate crimes is that you see more hate crimes, more hate speech, more um, actions against people who are different and um, you have more victimization. So there are concerns expressed or there were concerns expressed during uh, the city council budget committee hearing during which the Commission on Human Relations shared these hate crime numbers. Uh, concerns that they're going to go up as we get closer to the 2024 presidential election. Karen, what role do you think the political climate plays into all of this, if at all? Well, I think the political climate has driven the increase in hate speech. Uh, the political speech can sometimes be laced with hate crime. We've certainly seen it uh, during this recent governor's race. Um, there have been uh, statements just about Chicago, um, and it's largely driven, I would argue, by race. And so as we get into the presidential elections, as we continue, um, we will see more hate speech. Okay, something that is uh, obviously unfortunate, but something uh, to, to consider uh, going forward these next few months and, of course, a couple of years as we approach that 2024 presidential election. Janine Bell, Karen Freeman-Wilson, thank you both for joining us. Thank you so thank much. You. The general election is just days away, and already hundreds of thousands in Chicago have voted early or by mail. But across the state, there's a whole population of men and women who once lost the right to vote and then gained it back. But some of them aren't aware of that. And that's because a patchwork of state laws in the U.S. might make it confusing for anyone with a criminal record to know whether they have the right to vote in their home state. In this follow-up to our series, Permanent Punishment, a look at how advocates are working to ensure people with criminal records know their rights in Illinois. Trying to build a network of power, you know what I'm saying? Let people know that we could make change. When I was in prison, I had no idea I could vote. I didn't know that that was something that was returned to you when you became a citizen again. They're doing a great job at making you feel like you can't vote. Because a lot of people don't know. 
Like, sincerely, I was, I was shocked because there are so many rights that gets taken away from you the moment you catch a felony. That's one that we automatically almost assume. Because knowing that they have that on their background, it's hard for people to find jobs Absolutely. and vote yeah, and stuff sure. like that. Yeah. In Illinois, it's cut and dry. It's pretty simple. So while you're in prison serving your sentence, you don't have the right to vote. However, when you get out, your sentence is complete, you're out, your right to vote is restored. You just have to re-register. Often, you know, when, when I've spoken with folks who said, I can't vote, I have felony conviction, and we say, well, actually, you can, and their eyes get huge. They're like, you're kidding me. There have been people who had a felony in, like, 1986, and they've been out, but they don't know that they've had the right to vote since they've been out. It's a niche form of, of voter suppression. At least that's, that's how I'm looking at it. So what does that mean for a place like the Cook County Jail, where upwards of 70% of that population, so we'll talk about racial justice issues in the racial disparity for a second, the 70% of that jail or prison are black people. What does that mean when 38% of that prison is black, though black people represent somewhere around 13% of the population of the state? It means a, a racially disparate impact on our chief expression of citizenship. Cook County Jail is huge, has 6,000 roughly people incarcerated. The majority of people there are waiting for trial. We're with Chicago Votes. We come here every single month. Jail is pre-trial. That is while you are presumed innocent, right? You are innocent until, pr until proven guilty, supposedly. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Come. Take a seat, any seat. These young people, they have the right to vote if they are waiting for trial inside a county jail. Okay, and then I think you just sign it there and put the date. People will say, wow, I didn't know I had a right to vote. Um, and then we will say, for what, right? What are you voting on? It's judges. It's the state's attorney, it's the governor, it's state lawmakers, it is the Cook County Sheriff. These are incredibly impactful elections that impact people that are currently detained pre-trial. There was a realization that these folks need to have access to a polling location and same-day voter registration. So in 2019, Cook County Jail became an official polling location, the first jail in the country to be named such. Being able to vote is one of the clearest ways, one of the easiest to identify ways that, that we know that we're citizens, that we belong, for example, uh, to this country, to this city, to this town. Thankfully, in Illinois, people with criminal records have the right to vote, thankfully. In Illinois, even people on probation or parole have the right to vote. But currently, people who are currently incarcerated do not have the right to vote. The racial bias that you see in our criminal legal system is reflected in and amplified by felony disenfranchisement laws. When you help people to feel like they um, are a part of the democratic process, it um, empowers them. It makes them want to be more engaged in their civic duty and makes them want to um, do the right thing as a citizen. Power is the voice. The power is the numbers. The power are the people. So, and knowing that, we can change legislation by, by appointing the people who represent our values, our morals, our goals, that really want to help us. We're becoming aware that we have power in voting. And so, um, the ability to sway election, the ability to sway the election is the power. And the group Chicago Votes says it's advocating for Senate Bill 828, which would restore voting rights to people during their incarceration in Illinois. The American Civil Liberties Union shows that only two other states have done that, Maine and New Hampshire. Up next, affirmative action in college admissions. Supreme Court justices are hearing arguments over two cases on affirmative action. One deals with the University of North Carolina, the other Harvard. The court's conservative majority raised questions about the ongoing use of race in college admissions, signaling the high court could rule that race cannot be used as a factor in college admissions. Here's Paris Schutz and a portion of his conversation with litigator Alan King and Northwestern law professor Paul Gowder. They start with a brief summary of the two cases. 
So these are two independent challenges, although brought by the same, really, organization to challenge the use of race as a part of a holistic evaluation of students for college admission purposes. And so the North Carolina one is under the U.S. Constitution. The Harvard one is under a federal statute prohibiting discrimination in education. And, and it would have been one case, although Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson has ties to Harvard, and so uh, she has recused herself from the Harvard case, and she's on the North Carolina case. Uh, Alan King, the arguments uh, the plaintiffs are making here and, and the defense that the government is making. Well, yeah, I, I, I think obviously the, the one argument is that there's no longer a need for um, uh, considering the issue of race among the factors um, similar to what was done with the, the recent attacks on the Voting Rights Act um, and uh, I obviously think that that there is still a need to you know consider um, race um, both from the notion of really enriching the uh, educational environment and experience and I'm sure Paul can talk more about that but I think there's no question uh, and what the other side is arguing is that it, it, it adds to the enrichment of the educational experience and, and it has um, been know, those, precedent. Uh, for, for several decades established by the Supreme Court. So if the court overturns it, like in the Dobbs case, it's overturning another uh, major precedent uh, that's been set. The Solicitor General defending this case argued that there could be profound consequences if affirmative action went away. What could those consequences be? Well, so I think what you have to understand is that a lot of students are coming into college from backgrounds where the, the effect of our racial injustice in this society is still very much present, right? So think about, for example, the way that students of color are often educated under regimes where because of the disparate incomes between school districts, things like the availability of AP class, the effect of the unfair allocation of environmental risks in their neighborhoods, all of these factors cause students of color many times to not have the high school records that students from more privileged environments have. And so without affirmative action, even to, to capture the true ability of students who haven't started out, you know, think about Naperville versus Inglewood, right? To, mm -hmm. to, to, without affirmative action, really the schools are going to lose the capacity to find that talent. Uh, another thing to think about, and I can certainly say this from my representation of clients, that the business community and corporate America has never been more um, engaged on the issue of diversity and DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, you know, those companies are out there setting, in many cases, very aggressive goals. And, you know, companies are focused on this issue. And obviously, the, the pipeline for qualified, um, you know, outstanding uh, diverse talent is these colleges and universities. So um, if, if this gets overturned, you're going you're gonna to run into... A, a conflict of those those two, um, you know, societal values that we're dealing with. And, and, there, and nevertheless, Paul Goddard, it, it does seem like from the questioning from the conservative justices that they're very skeptical uh, of affirmative action and its impact over the last five decades or so. Uh, would that be kind of a tell that it does feel like this is going to be overturned. I mean, the fact of the matter is that there are six votes on the court that are all very conservative. And you know, I think it's highly likely, at least in the North Carolina case, I mean, one question that you have to ask as a matter of law is, why are the same arguments present in the North Carolina case and in the Harvard case? The Harvard case is under a federal anti-discrimination statute. But we know through a lot of other federal anti-discrimination discrimination statutes like Title VII, the employment statute, that affirmative action is permitted under those. And so one question that I have for the court is why would you, de why would you decide the constitutional case against the University of North Carolina and the statutory case against Harvard the same? They're different standards. And Har Harvard not being a public university, exactly. obviously, t uh, two different cases. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Alan King, Justice Brown Jackson brought up an interesting argument saying, you know, if race can't be a factor should things like veteran status or parental status 
be a factor as well? Is that, is that a compelling argument for the defense? I, I think it is. Uh, you know, people try to isolate and single out, you know, the issue of affirmative action, but, but there are countless other uh, factors that are plus factors, um, if you will, in the college uh, admission process. It, you know, legacy generally give, gives you a, a point, and um, as, as uh, the justice was saying today, um, you know, veteran status, individuals who have disabilities. Again, that was Parrish Schutz with Northwestern law professor Paul Gowder and litigator Alan King. To watch their full conversation, visit our website. We first introduced you to Sky Art at the beginning of the pandemic with their art therapy model helping communities process life experiences. Since then, they've continued that model with a practice that's helping former and currently incarcerated youth. Arts correspondent Angel Edo takes us back to Sky Art, this time with an introduction to one of their newer programs. Just Us, that's the name of a program created by Sky Art to create a safe space for youth ages 14 to 21 in the juvenile justice system. And instead of talk therapy, they're utilizing art therapy. Youth are oftentimes over-therapized is the term we use, where they have to tell their story and recount their trauma over and over and over again, sort of mandated, right? So we actually try to like reverse that a little bit and instead of sort of expecting them to recount their trauma, we actually invite them in to express those things in a different way. Director of Programs Devin Van Houten Maldonado says it's a program that began right after the pandemic and through their partnership with the Illinois Department of Justice, they're able to visit three different facilities on a weekly basis to practice this model. Black and brown kids are over-criminalized from the time that they're born. Oftentimes they have low self-esteem. They have not received the nurturing that they deserve you know, through foster care system, through poorly funded education. And so when we start making work with them, they say, I can't do this, I don't know how. And so that's why we say, do whatever you can do. Make lines, make marks, make colors. Maybe the only thing they've ever drawn is a gang marking. And so we let them start there. And then eventually what's beautiful is they let us help them cover those things up. And then eventually they gain skills of just drawing, of abstract thinking. And so for these kids, they're learning art skills that are more about critical thinking, thinking about why we're making what we're making. One of their longest participating members who currently resides at the Illinois Youth Center says before entering the program, he only saw drawing as something to do when bored. At first, I didn't normally look at it as a coping mechanism. I'm bored, I'm gonna do it. But now, I can clear my mind and just focus on this, on what I wanna draw. He has gained great um, confidence as an artist. And the collaborative piece is really important as well. You know, these are youth who oftentimes feel like um, they can't rely on anybody. You know, they've been told that they, they don't have a lot of value. And so them working together and working with us, again, it, it just helps to deconstruct that power dynamic a little bit. 21-year-old Adam Martinez joined the program at 18. He's since been released and is working a full-time job. And while he doesn't make art as much anymore, he says the lessons he learned while in the program still have an impact on him. I do find it therapeutic because, I mean, like when I'm drawing or painting, so I'm just in my own space doing whatever I want, you know, what's going on in my head. A lot of times when you're in there and you're just like on the unit all day, seeing the same faces, that's when people start getting into trouble. When you know you got something to look forward to, you want to be on your best behavior because you want to make sure you get to go to the program. All of their work is on display in a new three-part exhibition titled Can You See Me? It features work by the youth the program works with, as well as contemporary artists. Especially as a juvenile, as a juvenile, you don't always know what you're doing. You're just out with your peers. After some time, you just realize like you can't choose where you, who you grew up around, who you grew up with, or where you grew up at. It's just your environment. Some people grow out of that, though. On one front, we're creating access to those folks, sort of, we'll call them contemporary art viewing folks, right? That audience is going to have very little experience or understanding or knowledge about incarceration and youth incarceration. Putting the work by the youth alongside the contemporary artists, we're placing the same value on them as the work by the contemporary artists, and I think the contemporary artists actually would say the same thing. For Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Angel Ito. And you can visit our website for more information on how to see the exhibition at one of its three locations. 
And that's our show for this weekend. Be sure to check out our website, WTTW.com slash news, for the very latest from WTTW News. This includes everything you need to know about Mayor Lori Lightfoot's proposed spending plan for 2023. It's up for a vote on Monday. And with Election Day just around the corner, on Tuesday, check out our WTTW voter guide to hear from the candidates in their own words on why they want your vote. That's at WTTW.com slash voter guide. And if you're watching us on Saturday night, know that you can also catch Black Voices and Latino Voices on Sundays beginning at 10 p.m. And join me in Paris Shuts next week at 7 on Chicago Tonight. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that supports free educational initiatives in the legal profession.